Hello, everybody. We'll get started since it's 2.30 uh, now. So make things accessible. You guys have been staring at this phrase for a couple of minutes now, and I wanted it to be big and bold so that I could stand out so that you guys can have it sink into your brains. Because by the end of my presentation, what I would like is for all of you to go home and make things accessible. And I'm going to tell you why it's important. I'm going to tell you why it's beneficial. And then I'm going to explain a little bit on the things to look for, some of the fundamentals, some of the basics, so that um, you, know, you, you can build and develop more accessible WordPress websites. My name is Jordi Pintel. I hail from Toronto, Canada. And I own and operate a web development firm called the Genius Web Media. We specialize in uh, WordPress development, um, responsive development, and web accessibility. And so today's topic is going to be about WordPress theme accessibility and what to look for and whatnot. So make things accessible. Let that burn into your brains. Make things accessible. So what is web accessibility? According to the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative, web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. More specifically, Web accessibility means that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web, and that they can contribute to the web. It's powerful stuff. Why is web accessibility so important? For 56 million people in the United States of America are reported to have some form of disability. And that's in the 18 to 20% of the American population, considerable amount of people, considerable demographic, there are a lot of us out there. Billion, over a billion people in the entire world are reported to have some form of disability. It's a billion people. It's a lot of people that require some kind of assistance, that require some type of accessibility, that require the need to access information, either physically or online. Um, and so it's important that not only do we make the physical world accessible, but the virtual world should be as accessible, if not more, because we have more flexibility in doing so. Now with uh, web accessibility, you have certain benefits as well. So um, when you're implementing a web accessibility strategy, it does a few things. Now, number one, it forces you to be a better communicator because bad communication is inherently not accessible because you need to be able to describe things in a certain way for people that can't see, for instance. You need to be able to communicate in ways that are clear and understandable. You don't want to have to duplicate things because that can sometimes be troublesome for assistive technologies. So inherently, by implementing a web development strategy, or sorry, web accessibility strategy into your development, you're inherently becoming better communicators. Secondly, it has um, some pretty good SEO benefits too because you're forced to tag things. You're forced to add con uh, content or add keywords or add key phrases to your images or your videos, and that creates more content, and that creates more search engine optimized content. It can be crawled, it can be indexed, it can be ranked. So there are definitely a lot of um, benefits towards implementing a strategy that is based around web accessibility. Um, for the most part, a lot of people have this um, idea that Web accessibility is this big scary monster. Oh, we don't know about it. We don't know what it involves. There's a lot of stuff, and it's really not. Uh, a lot of it is uh, basics. It's, it's, it's just good clean coding. It's good communication, and it's keeping track of the finer details in your content, in your videos, in your images, etc. So it's really not all that big and bad and scary. And that's kind of what I'm here to advocate, is that uh, if you <coughs> create a web accessibility strategy and you build all your websites based on that strategy, then you're not looking at you know, uh, a lot of extra time or a lot of extra money you put into it because it'll all become very streamlined, it'll all become very natural to your development, and you'll be doing a lot of uh, good to those that require accessibility. You'll be creating an environment where anyone of any ability can log on to your website and can actually interact and understand what it is you're trying to say, or what it is you're trying to sell, or what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So it's pretty powerful. 
So WCAG 2.0 are some guidelines that have been put together in, in regards to uh, web content accessibility, making your website and your content more accessible. So WCAG 2.0 consists of four major principles. These are very uh, broad principles. Um, a lot of this stuff is very in-depth, so most of what I'm going to show you is just the fundamentals and the basics. The idea is that uh, you'll take what I explain, you'll go home, you'll do more research, and you'll make things accessible. So principle number one is perceivable. Information and user interface components must be presentable to users in ways they can perceive. So imagine trying to describe what a website looks like to somebody who can't see. How would you do that? How would you communicate that? How would somebody be able to perceive what it is you have on your page without being able to see, without being able to um, interact in, in, in normal fashions? So that's important. Having things like text alternatives, your alt text, your images, time-based media, um, adaptable content, and distinguishable content. So you want things that stand out, you want things that are clear, you want everything to be tagged properly so that it, if, you know, for instance, an image, if somebody can't see the image, your alternative text should be a small blurb about what that image is. So somebody who can't see it can paint a picture in their head and understand exactly what it is that most people would be looking at. So it's, it's uh, very helpful in that sense. Principle two is operable. So being able to actually operate your website. User interface components and navigation must be operable. So, uh, keyboard accessibility, um, being able to... What is time-based media? Sorry, time-based media is basically like sliders or anything that automatically animates or rotates. So the idea around that uh, time-based media is you always want to have uh, control over that. So if somebody needs more time to understand that slide or understand that uh, particular piece of media, they have the ability to pause, rewind, stop, etc. That way, um, they need more time that they can have that option versus, you know, your, most of your standard sliders usually just have the navigation allows you to go front and back, not really pause or play, which is important um, for those that may have cognitive disabilities and may need more time to understand what it is that you're writing. Having, having uh, those types of controls is really helpful. So time-based media is basically anything that is um, changing or altering based on time. Yes? Do you have website samples that you can, so you can look at? Website samples? Yeah, I'm saving that for the end. Principle two, obviously operable. So keyboard accessibility. Easy way to test for keyboard accessibility, unplug your mouse and try to navigate your website. If you're having a really tough time, then your website is not um, operable for, for accessibility. People that use assistive technologies they're going to need to have ways to interact with computers and websites that may be different than a keyboard and mouse. So it's very important that um, your website is operable in different formats, in different ways. So principle three, understandable. Obviously, you want people to be able to understand what it is that they're reading, whether it be um, using different uh, font sizes or proper um, <coughs> content, um, publishing methods, and whatnot. So you want everything to be very streamlined. You don't want to confuse the user by putting a lot of different abstract things on your page. You want things to flow in a natural manner, an understandable manner. You know, in North America, things should uh, go from left to right, top to bottom. That's kind of a standard that people understand. If you start to change that, um, it, it becomes less accessible because there's a learning curve. Somebody has to figure out how to understand your site. So keeping things very streamlined, keeping things very uh, standard is important for web accessibility. Principle four is uh, robustness. So content must be robust enough that it can be interpreted reliably by a wide variety of user agents, including assistive technologies. So basically, yeah, being able to plug in uh, a device that helps people navigate computers, you want your website to work well with that. Um, user agents like browsers, different web browsers. There is a web browser um, from a company based out in Canada and it basically, it's fully web accessible. It's got all the tools that you would need to um, 
navigate and understand and uh, perceive the website through this browser. So it's, it's, it's important that your website, when you're developing it, is robust enough that it can be applied or be used throughout all these different uh, assistive technologies. Yes? What's the name of that browser that you were just talking about? It's Essential, oh, I can't remember, Essential. Essential. Look up Essential Toronto, you'll find it. It's, uh, it actually is a cool, it's a really cool tool if you want to start to understand what different online tools are being used for accessibility. So like being able to change the color contrast and being able to change your font size and stuff like that. It's all built in. So if you want to get a really good sense of uh, the different tools that are implemented online for web accessibility, download the browser, fire up a website, and just use it. See how it works. So you see what you can do with it. It's a really, really good tool. So now WordPress theme accessibility. For those of you that may or may not know, WordPress.org has published guidelines for accessibility ready themes. So now, anyone who is a theme developer, they can add this accessibility ready tag to their theme and that essentially um, tells the user, whoever's buying it, that the template itself is accessible now. Um, even though the structure of the template may be accessible, it's important to remember that your content must also be accessible. So just purchasing an accessible theme and loading in all your content will not give you an accessible website. What it does is it provides you with all the uh, proper coding and scripting that an accessible framework or template will need. And then from there, it, 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 it's on you to load and uh, manage your content in an accessible way as well. Ooh. So there are a few guidelines um, based on theme accessibility. The first one are images. All decorative images must be included using CSS. Where theme authors add images to template markup, authors must incorporate an appropriately used alt attribute or means to provide one. So basically adding your alt tags, alt text to your images, um, it's pretty important. Like I said, you want to be able to paint a picture for somebody that can't see it. Second one is media. Media resources must not, must not auto start or change the user action as a default configuration. So again, your sliders. You don't want to just uh, load a page and have your slider and all kinds of uh, media start animating and changing. That can be uh, extremely difficult for, for some users. So it's important that your media is, has uh, the ability or the controls uh, to be able to manually <coughs> operate it without uh, without losing any of that content or without any um, misunderstandings or miscommunication with the content. So media, um, media controls are definitely important. Headings, this is a, a little bit more HTML based, so your headings, including the use of heading elements for page subsections. Heading markups must not be used for presentational purposes. So, you know, things like H1, H2, your heading tags, um, even though you can include them in your design, they should be more used for, um, for, for like screen readers. So when somebody uses a screen reader, the HTML headers kind of help you navigate through those. It's so how do you suggest handling the display then? Are you, are you suggesting that you don't put, um, you know, attach any CSS classes to, the, to that tag, like an H1? Um, you can, well for instance, like what we do is all of our H1 tags we use just for accessibility and then for style we just use H2, H3, H4, stuff like that. So we designate all, all of our H1 tags for strictly oh, so accessibility you're, use. You're, so like, you're saying only H1. No, 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 that's what just what we, that's what we do. I'm not oh, saying okay. that's how everyone has to do it, but that's it. how we, and so basically our H1 we position off screen, so you never see the H1. Um, <coughs> The H1 headings on the site, but when somebody plugs in a screen reader and, is, and the screen reader is reading through the site, it's going to pick up that and it's going to tell you this is what this page is, this is what it does, but it's never visible. It's always off screen. So link text in your buttons or in any link, you want um, links must avoid repetitive, non-contextual text strings such as read more. It should also make sense when taking out of context. Bare URLs must not be used as links. 
Bear URLs meaning posting www.blahblahblah.com, but adding a link to it, that's uh, what a bear URL would, would, uh, would look like. Uh, so you definitely want to avoid repetitive things and strings such as read more, find out more, and learn more. Something more appropriate would be, um, you know, find out more about our solutions or something along those lines where it's a little bit more descriptive. Also with text, or sorry, with links that um, lead to, like, like if you click on a link and it opens a new tab, it's always good to add that link text to tell your user that they're going to a new site. Somebody that can't see, they click on a link and it opens a new site. If they're using a screen reader or if they're using any other assistive technologies, it may be confusing. That person may not know they're in an actually a different site. So usually what we do is to say, you know, this is a link to this website, hyphen, this link will open a new tab. So that way when something a screen reader goes through it, that person's going to hear that and they're going to know if they click on it, it's going to lead them to a new site. Yes, sir? Is it okay to use like read more for like presentation and have like a title or name attribute in the link to kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like for, for our site, our blogs are always like read more and then the title of the blog. <laughs> and all of our blog posts, normally... Uh, WordPress by default attaches a link to your title as well as a read more button. You generally we use only one or the other because if you have both, that is considered repetitive. So if your title of your blog links to the blog and your read more button links to your blog, that's considered repetitive. So we usually remove any linkage from our blog titles and we keep it strictly to a read more button plus the title of the blog. So when a screen reader reads it, they're going to hear, read more about WordPress theme accessibility, if that's the blog title. So it's a little bit more um, direct. People, people that can't see will still know where they're going. And that's the idea. You want to be able to, it's almost like um, guiding. It's like, it's like having a guide dog, right? They're going to tell you where to go and when to stop and when to move forward. And kind of that kind of helps out. Uh, so link text is actually very important. So you want to be able to like I said, guide people through your site um, very easily and in a way that makes sense. Keyboard navigation, which we kind of already uh, touched on. Theme authors must provide visual keyboard focus highlighting in navigation menus. So what keyboard focus is, it, it's kind of like having a rollover where when you roll over a link, there's some kind of visual focus, either a border, a background color changes, there's some identification that this is a link and that this, uh, you know, this is going to do something to highlight certain, um, certain links and certain buttons. Uh, navigation by keyboard should also be intuitive and effective. So, like again, left to right, top to bottom, that's not how it works. You're certainly going to confuse somebody that can't see your website. Because they're going to assume that you're using a standard um, an intuitive format. And if you're not, then it's going to be quite confusing. So having a keyboard navigation is essential. That's one of the fun of the, that's one of the key aspects of accessibility is uh, the keyboard navigation. So color contrasts. People that have visual impairments, whether they're colorblind or, or have uh, you know, anywhere in between, um, having the proper color contrast is important. Because if you have um, you know, dark grays on top of black, it's going to make somebody with visual impairment, very difficult to read. So color contrasting is very, very important. You want to make sure that your content is uh, well contrasted with anything in the background. So if you're using a black background, use white text. If you're using a white background, use black text, because those are the perfect uh, contrasting um, colors. Uh, alternatively, you know, like blue and red, they work well in contrast and, and, and other stuff. But the, the idea is you don't want to make your content and your background, your foreground and your background, you don't want to make them too close, closely um, matching in color, just so that you can maintain that uh, contrast. And people who have uh, visual impairments, whether they be fully blind or partially blind, well, I guess partially blind, will be able to at least um, see everything they have on their site. So color contrast is another huge aspect. Um, it's kind of deep. There's a lot of stuff online about co the proper color contrasting that you should definitely look into. Question, yes. Is it reasonable to have a, is it reasonable to have, I mean, it reasonable to have a 
your client doesn't want a big contrast to have a link somewhere near the top of the site that is a choice to alter the color? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, uh, you know, like font sizes and color contrasting, you can find some cool plugins that will allow you to change those, like right on the front end. Um, yeah, that, that, that's acceptable. I mean, for the most part, we try and just um, make it make the contrast already you know, good to go. Yeah, without no, anyone having well, to change you it. You like but. that, and I like that, but the client does this. Yeah. Sure, yeah, you're always going to get those clients yeah, that are very picky, know. like designers, they're very picky about <coughs> the colors they use and whatnot. And so it can be challenging, and again, um, there are uh, some really cool plugins that will allow you to change color contrasts right on site, as well as like font sizes and whatnot. So um, those kinds of things are really readily available. Keyboard navigation we already talked about. Not too sure why that was duplicated. Skip links. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with skip links, but essentially it bypasses your navigation. It takes you directly to your content. So if you're using a keyboard and you're tabbing through all of your uh, links and content, Every time somebody reloads a different page, you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to force them to re-tab through your navigation. So what a skip link does, it says, skip navigation, go directly to content. That way, if you have 20 items in your link, somebody doesn't have to sit there and tab 20 times to get through content. So it's, a, it's an easy means to um, get people to skip your navigation and get directly to your content without having to repetitively tab through uh, a whole bunch of links. So skip, link, skip links is pretty important. Anyone that's familiar with, um, or any developer that uses uh, WordPress backend, you'll notice that that's built right in now. If you hit tab, um, when you load a page, the first option you're gonna get a skip link. Skip through the navigation, get right to the content, get right to where you need to be. Especially if you think about the WordPress backend, it's got a lot of uh, different links on the left-hand side. Imagine having to tab through that every time you wanted to do something. That would be a real pain in the butt. Skip links are really, really important. Yes, sir? Are additional skip links throughout the page, are those useful? Or say like every story page has like a block of related stuff that gets jammed in the middle of the story. Is it helpful to put those things in for people to jump past? Yeah, I mean for the most part you want to use skip links um, as just a means of, of kind of getting through the site quicker. So if you've got a page with a lot of stuff, it may be helpful. Like if you know the somebody wants to read content at the bottom of the page and not have to tab through a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, I mean it's it's not uh, specifically only for bypassing navigation. You can use that anywhere that kind of makes sense. You want to make it easier for people to jump around your site, I'd say that's good. Why not? Then forms. So forms is another big aspect, uh, and by forms I mean like contact forms, sign up forms, whatever it is. Anytime somebody has to type something in or fill something out, um, the appropriate fields should be labeled, because people should know what they're filling in. Imagine you can't see that this is for your name and this is for your email. You're going to want to properly label all of those fields so that a screen reader can say, this is for name, this is for your email, this is for your content. And that way you can easily navigate through the form and you can understand exactly what it is that you're filling in. So forms is another big area. Um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different components to making your forms accessible. And definitely it's one of the key elements to web accessibility. So uh, anyone that, that is interested in building accessible websites should definitely look into form accessibility. So it's, it's a big component. And also there's the, there's the link there, make wordpress.org, themes, guidelines, guidelines, accessibility. You can find that online, great resource. There's a lot of things in the make.wordpress.org in the accessibility group as well. It's really good stuff. So some WordPress accessibility tools. WordPress, and this is quoted from wordpress.org, WordPress, with a high-quality theme, works right out of the box to help you keep your site accessible. A great deal of the work is done for you, but you still have to take the time and patience to maintain those accessibility standards when creating your content. So WordPress, right out of the box, they've made a lot of strides, and in more recent versions have included a lot of accessibility features. Um, I'm actually part of the group that does some of the testing, and um, every week uh, we have discussions on how can we make WordPress in the back end as well as the front end more accessible. 
So in terms of uh, back-end accessibility, not only do we want websites to be accessible, but we want the tool to be accessible. We'd love it if people with different abilities could build websites. That, that to us would be phenomenal, phenomenal stride. When somebody that uh, has, let's say, a motor, motor skill um, disability um, could use their assistive technologies and, and, and build something cool, build their own websites. That, that to me is, it's, it's, it's empowering, empowering the individuals that, um, that require it. I wouldn't say any more than anyone else, but in, in the, um, you know, for instance, you know, those that have uh, motor skill disabilities, um, you know, they may not be able to uh, communicate in the same ways. They may not be able to travel. So things like being able to network, being able to communicate online, being able to do commerce online, being able to build a business online, like I did for myself, is hugely important. And WordPress allowed me and empowered me to do so. So, it's, and so for, for um, people with challenges and people with disabilities, it's, it's giving them that, um, that ability and that power to be able to build things, to be able to communicate with the world, to be able to live like everyone else. So and that's why it's important. That's why I'm here today. Here's a featured WordPress accessibility tool created by WordPress accessibility member Joel Dolson. Anyone should look, look up Joel Dolson. He's a pioneer for WordPress accessibility. He's done a lot of great work. This is his particular plugin called WP Accessibility. Now this particular plugin isn't going to modify or change any of your coding. So it's not going to optimize your content. It's not going to add um, your alt tags. But it will add a series of tools that will um, help make your website more accessible. For instance, it has built-in skip link. So you just set up um, where you want it, the plugin kind of does the rest for you. It's got a whole bunch of other tools as well in there that are just helpful in making your theme itself accessible. But again, it's very important that you also uh, remember to make your content accessible. Because if it's not, then um, all the work you put into making your theme accessible will kind of go to waste if none of your content is accessible. So keep that in mind. It's a great tool. I recommend everyone install it on all of their sites when they get home or after my presentation or right now if you've got a computer. All of your websites, every single one of them should have this plugin. You can find more web accessibility tools, uh, sorry, WordPress accessibility tools, uh, web accessibility tools, and evaluation tools as recommended by the WordPress accessibility group at make.wordpress.org slash accessibility slash useful tools. Um, this presentation will be online, so you don't have to like try and write down these long links. <laughs> It'll be online, you'll be able to access this uh, after WordCamp is over, and uh, you'll be able to take a look at all this stuff. But keep in mind that there's a lot of great tools out there that can be used in terms of uh, you know, adding tools to your website, color contrast, and evaluation tools are pretty important as well because um, it allows you to input your website URL and it's going to tell you all the things that aren't accessible. So if you need a way to, or if you have no idea of how to make your site more accessible, you uh, use one of these evaluation tools, you plug in your URL, and it's going to tell you everything you need to know. And then all you got to do is uh, take all the recommendations, code them into your site, and you're good to go. Website accessibility evaluation. So the first tool is the most popular website accessibility evaluation tool available, and it's called WAVE. WAVE.WebAIM.ORG. Awesome tool. It's a free web-based tool to help web developers make their web content more accessible. So like I said, you launch the site, it's going to ask you for your URL, you plug it in, and it's going to tell you exactly what is and isn't accessible. And I'm going to show you how it works. The second tool is another very popular tool. It's called A-Checker, and it's a free web-based tool again. Um, and it focuses on checking HTML a little bit, a little bit uh, more so than Wave. Wave is a little bit more content-based. This one's a little bit more HTML-based. So using the two in combination is definitely uh, more full circle than using one or the other. So let me quickly demonstrate that to you. So this is Wave. This is the home page, very basic. All it's asking is for your URL. You 
genius.ca, which is our website, our corporate website. I'm just going to fire up. So basically, on the left-hand side, you have your legend. So it's going to tell you what errors, what alerts, features, structural level elements, HTML5, and ARIA, and contrasting errors. So we've got one error and uh, tw 20 features, so we're pretty good. We've uh, tried to make this site as accessible as possible. Uh, this is actually was just launched uh, on Friday, so we're pretty pleased about that we it. And again, it'll actually pinpoint all the elements on your page. All right, so you can see in green, we have our features. You can see here we have our tags, et cetera, et cetera. So it pinpoints all the different elements on your page, and it's going to tell you whether it's accessible or not. So this is a pretty powerful tool. It's definitely, um, if you're adamant about making your websites more accessible, this is a great tool to use to kind of get there. It's really simple to use. Um, it also allows you to choose from different standards. So you can filter it by, w, so WCAG 2.0 has three common standards, A, AA, AAA. All of them have different uh, minimal requirements. So level, single A uh, WCAG 2.0 guidelines is obviously a lot, is more minimal than let's say AA or AAA. AAA, um, AAA guidelines kind of require you to build a separate site. It's like really dumbed down. Imagine like HTML sites from like 20 years ago. It's just text, you know, nothing fancy. That's that would be your ideal AAA standard. AA and single A, you can optimize any website to kind of comply with those two. So it's good to be able to go through those different options and see where your guidelines fall, or where your website falls within those guidelines. So it's a pretty robust tool. It'll give you everything you need, and I definitely recommend that uh, if you're gonna build websites, not if, when you build your websites accessible <clears throat> after this presentation. Everyone should be logging onto Wave, everyone should be firing up their websites, and everyone should be taking note as to what they see and making the proper adjustments. So that was a quick demo. Really simple to use. Um, Development-wise, pretty straightforward. It'll tell you what you need to fix. If you're intermediate to advanced developer, you should not have any problems implementing those changes. So to conclude, if you care about WordPress and the internet, they contribute to making WordPress a more accessible tool for those with challenges. That's uh, contributing to the WPA11Y, WP Accessibility Group, doing testing for WordPress.org, doing testing for uh, themes, doing audits, uh, doing reviews. There's tons of different things uh, that anyone of any different skill, whether you have uh, expert development um, experience to absolutely no development experience, there are so many different things that can be done to make WordPress more accessible. So I encourage you all to check out the WP A11Y group and find a way to contribute, find a way to give back, find a way to make WordPress more accessible for everyone. If you care about the quality of your work and you care about people in general, then ensure you develop your WordPress websites with web accessibility in mind. Again, 56 million Americans, 1 billion people in the world have some form of disability. It's a huge number, so if you, if you care about those people and you care about your work, then go the extra mile. Make your websites accessible. If you care about your local WordPress communities, then ensure that your meetups or your WordCamp events are also accessible. So not only should the tools and the websites be accessible, but so should the communities. I think. Uh, the opportunity to network and the opportunity to, to meet people is, is, is empowering for anyone that wants to grow a business, for anyone that works for a company, that wants to get known, wants to get out there, um, make your communities accessible. There are a whole bunch of different criteria that anyone could look up online to making their events more accessible. It's really straightforward stuff, nothing that uh, can't be done and nothing that's, uh, um, you know, there may be some additional costs in making events a little bit more accessible, but at the end of the day it's what we're 
And so basically, um, you know, these are basically the three things that I'm here to kind of advocate. And again, make things accessible. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, what about ARIA? How, exp how uh, essential is that? It's pretty important. I didn't get into it because it's kind of technical. I wanted this to be kind of a non-technical presentation because I wanted people to kind of be aware of it. But uh, ARIA and HTML5 accessibility is huge. I would definitely look up ARIA if you're interested in accessibility. Figure out what it does, figure out how it works, figure out how to use it, and implement it. Start implementing it right away. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you had a, I noticed your website has a bunch of great presentations. Is this one also going to be up there? You had so much good information, I couldn't catch all of the oh, slides. Oh, this, yeah, this yeah, presentation will be online, yeah. It'll, okay. it'll, it'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to, usually the organizers of the work camps make, make all of us submit our talks. So you'll, either on the work camp Boston site, you'll have the link, or uh, it's online. This is actually a public presentation on Google, Google presentation, or Google Why Docs. Yeah, I'll post it up. I'll post it up on Twitter. I'll post it up on Facebook. Good job. Um, there's my Twitter handle, so if anyone wants to tweet, or if anyone wants to view our tweets, definitely check us out. And yeah, I'll, I'll post this up on Twitter for those of you that want to oh, look at it. No, look at I'm it. I'm sorry, I came a little late. I was at Happy Bar. <laughs> That's okay. Happy Bar is a good place to be. And that your Twitter is at Genius. At Genius Web Media. Look us up. We're cool. <laughs> yes. Right, so your page headings um, basically, um, so you kind of want to split, basically you want at least one of your page headings to be basically just to describe, more descriptive, right? So you wouldn't put like your H1, like on your website, you wouldn't want to put something too long because it's going to take up a lot of space and it's not going to be, um, it's not going to look very good. But in terms of accessibility, what you could do is you could set it to like you know left positioning off screen, you know minus a thousand or plus a thousand. It'll get rid of it. You won't be able to see it. But to a screen reader, it'll still they'll still pick up on it because it's actually in your HTML. So you can add something like you know this is our page for our services. We offer these three services. That way, when somebody gets to the page, they get that that's actually read out in the screen reader. So, so the, the idea is. Very literal description of what that page is for. Yes. Specifically for a non visual visitor. Specifically for screen readers. And it's still, and then, and then use your H2 as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, was just, that was just an example. Like, you can, you can set it up in different ways. Like, if you want, you can have your, you can have your H1 as a style, and you can have your H2 as accessible. It really doesn't matter. But the idea is to have. One of your headings should be specifically for, for accessibility. Not all your headings should be for style. Yes, sir? Is there a tool-like way that's online that uh, shows you the output of your page as a screen where you can see it? Not really. And that's the, that, it's a bit of a challenge, because you would need somebody that has a screen reader to kind of go through that. So in terms of being able to test for accessibility, there are a lot of strides there need to be made because for the most part um, you got to find somebody that's got the technology to, to actually be able to determine. I mean you can get a good gauge if you if your communication and your text is very clear and it makes sense, you're not repetitive, um, you're being very uh, concise with what this element of the site is going to do, you should be good. And again, um, Wave is going to tell you for the most part, it won't output what a screen reader would interpret, but it'll tell you, you know, this is repetitive or this is uh, not communicated well. They have, they've got all their technical terms in there. But uh, you can get a good idea of, of uh, where you've gone wrong from using it. But for the most part, yeah, uh, there, there are still some challenges in testing it fully. Yes, sir, in the back. just want to throw it out there that uh, Firefox has a JAWS uh, plugin that yes. uh, kind of interprets it a little bit. I mean, it might not be perfect, but I think it's useful sometimes. Yes, so the comment in the back was Firefox it does have a web browser extension that you can download. It kind of does that for you. Um, we've used it once or twice, I'm a little bit reluctant, and you know, 
it's kind of in its early phases, but uh, you know, it, it, it does a pretty decent job. I didn't include it here simply because uh, I use Google Chrome, <laughs> so uh, I wasn't going to advocate a Firefox plugin. <laughs> <laughs> Not to say that Firefox is bad. If anyone likes Firefox, fantastic. That's just my preference. Yes? Hi, could you back to the wave analysis, maybe, and explain just a little bit what was going on in the sidebar and what it was saying Sure. Thank you. Okay. So she asked me to revisit wave and to uh, kind of explain a little bit more. So basically, uh, what you're seeing on your, uh, right on your design here are um, all the different elements that kind of um, determine what it is and uh, how you can make it a little bit more accessible. So right, if you look on the, on the left hand side is kind of the explanations to all these little markings that you see on the right hand side. And so for the 20 features, um, We have uh, you know link images with alternative texts. Um, we have structural elements or headings, um, unordered lists as well. So lists they also have uh, specific accessibility guidelines. Um, so when it says like twelve linked images with all text, is that a good thing or is that a yeah? Bad thing? Anything in green is good. Okay. Green is always good. So that's saying that the twelve elements on this page or the twelve images on this page all have all text for the most part. Um, are there also eight that are missing alt text, and that's bad? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> it's so in some cases, again, and this is really for um, uh, the perceivable parts. So some images you don't want to include intensive leg -like explanations for. It's tough to explain, but uh, the eight dollar empty alternative text is good. It's green, so it's good. But yeah, it's, again, it's really about the communication, right? So you don't want to over-populate um, your website with a lot of description or a lot of alt text because on a screen reader, it's, um, you know, it, it, there's going to be a lot of information, right? So you want it to be uh, concise but detailed uh, at the same time, if that makes sense. The, the, like I said, the, there's a lot of technical stuff that I didn't get into that would probably answer that question a lot better, but I don't want to overcomplicate this particular presentation at this moment. But if anyone has any more questions, I'll be around all day. So, yes? So the, the sidebar then is not telling you that something is wrong, it's just oh, it will. listing it will. <coughs> Well, if there were errors, like the top one, there's one error. Okay. Document language missing, I'll have to look into that, because I'm not 100% sure what that means. It'll tell you too, this little I, right? It's got all the information you need. What does it mean? The language of the document is not identified. Why, why it matters. So it gives you all the important information for every guy. Okay. So errors are going to show up as red. So if there were a lot of errors, you would see a lot of those red tags. This particular site, because we worked on making it accessible, a lot of it's green. So we did a pretty good, pretty decent job. Yeah, it'll tell you how to fix it too. Which is that, That's the idea, right? It's going to tell you everything you need. It's going to tell you why it matters. It's going to tell you how to fix it. So it gives you everything you need to Make your site more accessible, yes. So, say so you have the image with an empty alt tag, would you potentially do that on purpose because it was followed by a heading, and so you'd avoid the alt tag to not have repetitive Well, yeah, text? yeah. So in some cases, like, you know, if your heading followed by an image, you wouldn't want to repeat that. It would be considered cut. Exactly. That, right. That's kind of the idea. So having an empty alt tag, depending on where it is on the page, is, is a good thing because it reduces that repetitiveness and Kind of just makes it makes the site flow a lot better. A lot of this stuff, like the alt tags, is for screen readers. So people that can't see, the screen reader reads out what's on the page and reads out some of the alt tags that you can't see. It's going to read those out as well. So if uh, a title follows an image and both of them have the same, that can be confusing. The person that can't see the site <coughs> is going to think there's something duplicated or that something doesn't make sense. So in certain situations, having no alt tag is good. In most situations. Having them is good. Again, it's uh, it really depends on the um, perceivability of the site. I want people to be able to understand it in a certain way. I mean, if that makes sense. So really, what it comes down to in judging where you need alt text and where you don't need them. If it's if it's repetitive, you definitely don't want it. 
If it's something that hasn't been said already, you definitely want to do it. Yes? You're talking about images. Does Ray also include images of the tips of JPEGs and does it work with video? So, video, no. Video, for the most part, to make your video accessible, you just have to caption it. So, anytime. Closed caption. Yeah, it's not going to show you that here. Video just needs to be closed caption. It's accessible. For the most part. You can't do anything else to a video to make it accessible, other than build a, a, a caption for it. Um, but yeah, it's going to tell you, all the, you know, no matter what image type you're using, it's going to give you a report on it. it there's no, it's not image specific or format specific, to, to be honest. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, there are, um, for the most part, yeah, it's not going to pass any of that stuff through it. It's just going to be the content. So it knows where to, like, that's why the headings are important as well. Screen reader is going to pick up H1, H2, it's going to pick up those things. Um, and as well, um, it's mostly, the screen reader is mostly just content based. It's never really going to, like, output any of your CSS or JavaScript. It's just going to output, it, it's basically just for reading content. It's not for reading script. So I have one minute left. I'll take one more question. You in the back, sir. You haven't asked one yet. Go okay. nuts. Um, you mentioned unplugging your mouse is a great way to uh, experience a website through someone who's disabled. Um, is there a way to do that with screen reading? Are there programs that will read a web page? Because I know the screen readers themselves tend to be rather expensive. Right, right, yes. Um, well, yeah, the, there was mention of the Firefox plugin kind of does that. I mean, outside of having an actual screen reader, it's going to be a bit difficult. This particular uh, wave, it's going to, um, like a lot of the alt tag recommendations and stuff are for screen readers. So it's not going to output what a screen reader may interpret. But it's going to tell you where you need to adjust your content so that screen readers can properly interpret that information. Okay. It's a bit tricky, but um, there are tools that can kind of uh, lead you in the right direction for the most part. Thank you. I think that's all the time I have. I'm going to be around all day. If anyone has more questions, come find me. I love answering questions. And uh, thank you very much.